Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the second annual City Nature Celebration here at Main Street Landing. We're really uh, pleased you're here, and uh, yeah, awesome. My name is Walter Pullman. I, I'm an ecologist up at the University of Vermont, and I'm just pleased to be here with so many colleagues, so many community members, so many students uh, coming out tonight. Uh, to participate in this really introductions the kickoff to a week of celebration of the more than human world in the greater Burlington area. Before I turn it over uh, to the next folks, I want to really acknowledge that this is a, a, a amazing partnerships of groups coming together. As an ecologist, it's all about the relationships within systems is what we study. And to have a group of organizations coming together to think about the more than human world and how might we document that, share it, teach about it. These are all the organizations involved. You can see that the cities of Burlington, uh, Winooski, Colchester, South Burlington are involved. Um, we have the Winooski Valley Park District, uh, Burlington Wildways, Vermont Natural, Master Naturalist Program. I'm from the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources up in UVM. Declan, who you're going to meet, is from St. Mike's. We need to have St. Mike's right on here as a key partner in this, too. And uh, the Burlington, uh, the, the Burlington, um, sorry, the Greater Burlington Sustainability Education Network is sort of an umbrella group that's bringing a lot of folks together thinking about the sustainable development goals and biodiversity protection. Um, Half Earth and the Vermont Alliance for Half Earth. Special nod I want to give to our uh, partners here who are hosting us. Main Street Landing hosting us in this beautiful facility uh, tonight is fantastic. And Media Factory for capturing this event and uh, broadcasting it live and uh, also in the future. So thanks to our partners. Speaking of partners, I'm going to uh, introduce two folks here who uh, are, have been key involved in this. Uh, Zoe Richards, Director of Burlington Wildways Partnership and the Vice Chair of the Burlington Conservation Board, and Alicia Daniel, uh, in just a moment, from UVM and the, the Field Naturalist Program, as well as uh, the, the Burlington Parks Recreation and Waterfront, and is the Executive Director of the uh, Vermont Nat Master Naturalist Program. So they're going to do a little bit of introduction as well, and then introduce our speaker for tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to you uh, first. Uh, Zoe, welcome. Great. Thank you, Walter. Um, can you just switch the slides for me? Yes. <laughs> you just go to the next slide. Yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to um, just uh, talk to you a little bit about our Burlington Wildways partnership. Um, and. Uh, uh, Walter alluded to this that this is a partnership group and if you just go to the next slide for me and it's based on this um, as we're talking about biodiversity um, and um, the biodiversity crisis and conservation and really trying to think about how do we keep um, all these amazing species that we have within the city of Burlington and hopefully also within the surrounds um, together viable and accessible to our citizens um, for you know, generations to come, um, we, you know, we, we have an amazing opportunity in Burlington. This is a map of open space, and you can see that there is a lot of open space in Burlington. We have the Winooski River to thank for that because there's a lot of floodplain um, in Burlington, but we also have conserved a lot of pieces over the years, and we really have, um, just to steal Alicia's language, we have a green heart in the middle of Burlington, and um, how lucky are we to have that? And Walter, if you just go to the next slide. But one of the things that we noticed was if, if you look at the green space map, you see this beautiful connected piece. But if you look at who owns that space, there are many owners. Um, and it's one of the reasons that many folks within the city don't fully understand what it is that we own. It's hard. It's not as it is connected um, ecologically, but it, uh, it's hard to move through some of these areas. And um, so we really, a bunch of the major public facing landowners banded together to say, how can we work together um, uh, for shared goals and shared aims? And so we have um, formed a group, which we call Burlington Wildways, um, that really supports some of that work. And as Walter pointed out, these are the major partners. And we have many other partners who we work with very, very regularly who support a lot of our work and efforts. But that's just a little bit about who we are. And I'm actually going to pass it over to Alicia, who's going to really introduce our fabulous speaker. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you, Zoe. Say thank you, Walter. So um, 
as Walter s suggested, um, I have a variety of hats that I wear. Um, but the one I'm going to wear tonight, are you hearing me? OK, good. Uh, to talk to you is the Vermont Master Naturalist hat. And that's just because this is where Declan and I most recently intersected was around Vermont Master Naturalist work. But I really got my start in the field naturalist program. So who's here is a field naturalist? Can you raise your hands? Woo! All right, looky there. <laughs> and who here is a Vermont Master Naturalist? All right, so we showed up tonight. Thank you. Um, so uh, after teaching for about 30 years in the field naturalist program at UVM, um, I realized that there was the potential to tell the story of every town in Vermont in five chapters. So those chapters are its, its bedrock geology, sort of, you know, so in this instance, I'm looking at landscapes, not like looking down on them like you would a map, but slicing through them like you would a cake. And then if you take that cake and lay it down through time, uh, you have the, what happened to create the bedrock geology, which in Burlington, there's an amazing story of continents colliding and oceans closing and uh, the thrust fault that you can see at Rock Point. So we have a great chapter here in Burlington. And then um, many, many years later, so, so the bedrock in Burlington is about 500 million years old. The glacial story is about 12,000, 13,000 years old. So that's all about the different bodies of water that stood over us. One was a freshwater proglacial lake called Lake Vermont. Um, it laid down a lot of the clay soils that make up the farming lands in the Champlain Valley. But in Burlington, a, another chapter of that story is as that proglacial lake drained, there was the Champlain Sea that we actually were under salt water for a while. So if you had looked up, you'd have Native Americans in canoes fishing above us right here at Main Street Landing. Um, and as that, and I won't go into all the details, but talk to me later if you want them. Uh, as that sea drained slowly over the city, the Winooski River deposited this enormous delta that covers all of the greater Burlington area, really. The towns that Walter discussed are under some of this sand, and it's what makes the northern part of Burlington quite sandy. If you have any of you garden in the north end of Burlington and have are you have sandy soils? Yes, you can thank the Winooski River <laughs> for those if, if you feel like it. <laughs> and then uh, shortly right at the time the sea was draining through this landscape, people showed up with their technology, our technologies, people's technologies of fire and weapons and that's where we started to impact the wildlife in the area very strongly. And a lot of people maybe don't know that we used to have uh, mastodons and mammoths roaming in that tundra environment that followed the glaciers right in the Burlington area. And Walter, you found or know of or own a piece of a, a tusk. Is that true? You're trying to find a whole woolly mammoth in the Richmond area, right? Yeah, so, so there is evidence. There's hard scientific evidence that these big mammals were here and probably hunted out uh, by small tribes of people that were here early on. Um, and then, of course, Europeans arrived at, at some point. And much of Vermont was deforested, including of all, almost all of Burlington. Um, much of that was used to pasture sheep, but there were other things going on as well. So as we walk down this timeline toward the present, we started to get closer and closer to where Declan and I met. Um, and we met at the University of Vermont in the mid-90s. Um, and I, we were both in graduate school. Um, I went on to specialize in everything, which means I really specialized in nothing. Uh, Declan, on the other hand, went on to specialize in insects, which is a reach uh, for a lot of people. But a love of his. But not only insects, but aquatic insects. So just to raise the bar um, on trying to engage people, <laughs> he chose aquatic insects, which I understand Declan means that like you, it's like going fly fishing, like you're wading in rivers, but you're turning over rocks and you're looking at, at the flies. You're not looking at the fish, right? Is that a good description of what? So oddly enough, our paths didn't cross much during that period. <laughs> I don't know why, but we didn't see each other a lot out in the woods. Um, but then we came back together 
recently, um, and we had both found uh, our, an interest in a particular passion, oops, I went the wrong way, um, which was wildlife um, and animals, which I have to say I, I was always interested in, but became particularly interested in um, when I connected with a tracker named Sophie Mazawida, and she began to gather data, systematically gather data through iNaturalist and, and, and start to describe what was going on in towns. And I'll let Declan tell you more about why this is important, but this is actually a tool that can help with planning for, for, for saving open space, really. Um, so uh, the idea is to give the, the, the animals habitat, and it's important to know where they are. They're adaptable. You know, they'll move into the corridors that are available, but you need to leave them some so that they can get around and I'll, I'll let so so Declan's job and I'll actually give you an official introduction of him now that I've kind of told you our overlapping story um, but he's going to bring all these little dots to life for us tonight he's going to tell us the story of some of these species that appear in this Burlington and uh, South Burlington map so Declan McCabe is an ecologist and a professor of biology at St. Michael's College he teaches ecology and evolution at the introductory level and upper level courses in community ecology and aquatic biology. After trying for decades to convince students that insects rule the world, he finally broke down and agreed to lead them in wildlife research projects using trail cameras. Most of his work has focused in the St. Michael's College natural area with occasional projects in Burlington and South Burlington. His first book, Turning Stones, Exploring Life in Freshwater, will be available this summer. So congratulations. You hope so. We hope so, too. So Declan, here you go. Well, thank you. Thank you for the very nice introduction. Now I have to live up to it. <laughs> so I am going to talk about some of these dots, that's for sure. Um, we've been having a whole lot of fun with the trail cameras. Uh, when the students told me they wanted to work on cool animals, and I said, caddisflies are so cool, they weren't buying it. So they like these things. I'm going to borrow photographs from all kinds of people. And the good photographs were not from a trail camera, most generally speaking. The good ones are from actual photographers. So there's a bit of a difference between photography and trail cameras. And so Kyle Tansley is one person who I just emailed him and said, hey, can you send me some nice pictures from Burlington? And he did. And uh, so go by his, his calendars. He, he, uh, he does it for fun, but uh, he also sells a calendar or two. So I'm going to talk about who lives here, where they are, what we can do to help them out, and um, away we go. So um, we've already mentioned once or twice iNaturalist. Get an account if you haven't already got it. Um, if you want some content to read or to share as a teacher or just for fun, go to Northern Woodlands Magazine. Put in Peleated Woodpecker or whatever you're interested in. And you'll probably find several articles. And if there's a topic you put in and you don't find an article, well, why don't you write it and send it to them? They might publish it. So anyway, uh, Burlington-specific stuff. Um, there's some really good stuff coming from the uh, Parks District. And Alicia has a lot to do with that. So, uh, And you can write for them, too. I'm sure she'd love an article or two, right? And probably a lot of these people in, in the room, I'm, I'm, I'm confident this is the choir who, who write these things, right? So anyway. Um, as a kid, there was a friend of mine, Michael White, and I went to watch badgers. And we went out in the middle of the night. We climbed up trees. We dressed into full camouflage. We blackened our faces. We hid in a tree. We did this four times, and one time we saw a badger. So mammal watching is hard. If you Google bird watching organizations, you'll get a laundry list. And I Googled mammal watching organizations, and I came up with this, which looks like a commercial outfit. <laughs> so you need something else. And uh, here we go. This is the tool, the infinitely patient trail camera. Um, they are cheap. You can strap them to a tree. You can walk away. And if nobody steals it, you're in good shape. I've, I usually run about 22 at a time. Um, in my six or seven years of doing this, I've had five stolen in total. So, you know, it's a risk. But there you go. All right. So, uh, you know, you've seen maps already. Um, we are in a very, very green state. And you can see... To the north, there's lots of greenery, and you can see to the south, there's lots of greenery. 
and to the east. You know, and then of course you got the lake to the west. It's a good lake. All right, um, but all of these little patches are important, and people will sometimes talk about wildlife corridors, and you kind of have this vision of a ribbon moving through the landscape. It can also be a series of stepping stones, and so we are at the point where we have lots of stepping stones, and if we preserve them, we will have wildlife. So, um, you know, I don't want to belabor this too much. This is where I work. Uh, I don't know if we've got a pointer. Yeah, we do. Look at that. This is where I work. And uh, this is 365 acres of Winooski floodplain. Until 2018, this was a cornfield, and this was a cornfield. And they are now regenerating floodplain forest. And if you want to go there for the bio blitz, ramble around. It's a kind of a cool south-facing sun trap valley. So we get some unique stuff in there. The, the Dutchman's bridges are already up and running. So go in there and see some, some nice spring wildflowers. You're welcome anytime. There's four miles of trail. So. Corridors and stepping stones. And so what we do when we're doing this work is we'll set out 20 or 22 cameras and we'll put them on a GPS and map them so we don't lose the bloody things. So far we have not lost a single camera because we couldn't find a location. <laughs> so far, touch wood. Um, so when I show you some cool trail camera pictures, it's not like I have a single trail camera and I'm getting wonderful pictures. I have a lot of trail cameras and I have an army of people working with me. This project, I worked with Lena Saswaki, and she helped me supervise um, several, several students, St. Michael's College students, to make this project happen. So all of the Burlington ones, she gets full credit for. All right, even though there, a lot of them are selfies, right? They're animal selfies, but she gets a lot of credit for strapping the cameras to the trees and shepherding the students and managing everything. So I'm going to talk about just animal by animal, some of the most common things that we get. So red foxes are most commonly seen. This is based on iNatural num iNaturalist numbers. And some of that is because they're a bit less nocturnal. They're out there in the daytime. And they are found less with coyotes because coyotes will make a snack out of them if they can catch one. They're very, very distinctive and, you know, identifiable. There's nothing you could possibly confuse a uh, red fox with for. So I'm going to see if this is going to work. No, it didn't. Let's go back. So I might need Walter's help here. Well, maybe the video won't work. Is this a touch screen? Well, we might not be having videos today. Any thoughts? Okay, what, am I, what do I need to touch to make it? I'm not a Macintosh person. You know how it is. So this is a video. Oh, I see. There we go. Okay, so this, this is in Colchester. This is out somebody's window. This this is um, Claudia Faf, my, my son's cross-country running coach from high school. And she put this up on Facebook two days ago, and I said, can I have that? <laughs> so this is this is a, a, a den of foxes under her porch. Like, they literally nest in there. There's five, five cubs, five kids, and uh, she's having a good time watching the whole family. So lots and lots of ways to enjoy wildlife, right? So... Uh, this goes on for a while, so I'm not going to belabor it, but um, it's uh, over there. They're, they're eventually getting the real lunch, and she is having a good time watching the fox bring back various rodents um, and laying them out for, the, for, for her, her babies to find. This is one of Lena's photos from the trail camera project. You know, they're out during the daytime. You can get color pictures, right? Sometimes you just get the back end, but nothing's going to possibly be confused for that tail, right? <laughs> And sometimes you get them at nighttime, and we get a lot of fuzzy pictures like this. And there's tricks that we teach the students to distinguish the, the three common dogs that we have. So, yeah, that's kind of fun, isn't it? Uh, Kyle will lay out in the woods, like literally lie down on his belly in a, in a wetsuit, you know, in the, in the swamp to get some of these photographs. It's incredible what he does. So, yeah, I respect real photographers. <laughs> Did you want to get a picture of that? No? Okay. All right. So gray foxes are a completely different animal. And when I say they're a completely different animal, they're probably as different as a human and a baboon. That's, you know, they're, they're really distant cousins. So if you go up there, you'll find the red fox somewhere. There it is. Here we go. So the red fox is way up there. And if you follow through the evolutionary tree, you've got to come back more than 10 million years to the common ancestor with the gray fox. So they're a very, very different dog. Very, very unusual. If you happen to find skulls in the woods, 
it's very conveniently they're they're barcoded for you. There's V for Vulpes, which is Red Fox, and then U for Eurocyon, which is the the, uh, the Gray Fox. And the first rule of finding skulls in the woods: if you do find one, it is always a raccoon. Um, the reason for that is raccoons are very very common and have a very very robust skull, so it's the most common skull you're likely to find. Um, kind of kind of fun, but yeah, there's there's various Facebook groups on skulls, and it's a standard joke. Any little fragment of bone that shows up, everyone will answer, "It's a raccoon." So, or a brown recluse, they'll call it that too. But anyway, that's another story for another day. Anyway, here is a gray fox in daylight. They're very different, very distinct from a, a, a red fox. How's this mic working? Am I doing okay for position? Yeah, okay. I'm not a microphone type of person. And that's what they look like at nighttime. You know, they've got this little cat-like face. And even with these lights here, you know, it, it isn't much better than that. <laughs> so you get a lot of fuzzy nighttime images. So, um, the other video I have, if you don't mind, Walter, thank you. I, I'm Macintosh, uh, whatever it is. They say that these animals can, can climb, and it's great to hear that in the lecture. Oh, yeah, they can climb. What does that really mean? This is what it means. And it's unlike any other dog species we've got. They can literally climb up a tree like that. So when I heard the first lecture about, oh, yeah, they can climb, I was thinking, you know, they're climbing up through the bushes or something. But they literally can run up a tree. It's incredible. And that's why they can coexist with coyotes. So you'll get these in places where coyotes are present, and there are papers looking at the correlation, and they do well when trees are present. So I stole that from Texas Backyard Wildlife. So that worked. Now what's happening? Ah, I've killed it. <laughs> Help! I hope that's not the last slide. I hope you enjoyed the talk, folks. <laughs> I'm not pushing anything. Okay, there you go. Coyotes. Coyotes. Um, among hunters, there's a, there's a certain uh, dislike for coyotes. I have discovered it among my Vermonter friends. And uh, hmm. uh, maybe I'm pressing the wrong button here. Could be operator error. Yeah, yeah, that's a good side to go to. Okay, I'm going to try the forward button. Okay, we're working. Okay, so we didn't have them around here is the bottom line, and they snuck in around the top of the Great Lakes. They hybridized with wolves along the way. They made it to New England in the early 20th century, and this is sort of a fun genetic way to look at them. So the western coyotes are represented in red at the far end here, and you can see that their genetic profile is very much western coyote, and they are western wolves, eastern wolves, and domestic dogs. And then you get into places like Ohio and the Northeast, and you can see that you're looking at 70, 75% coyote over here, and an admixture of two different types of wolves and domestic dog. So when the locals around here call them coy dogs, they are not wrong. And when they call them coy wolves, they're not wrong either. So uh, no point in debating the name of them. This is what you're looking at out there, and they are bigger. And so we wanted a teaching exercise about this, for our students, and so we went to the obvious place, and we went to eBay, and purchased a bunch of skulls. And the the goal was to have 20 northeastern skulls and 20 western skulls to have a comparison, quick lab, measure the skulls, go home again. Everybody's happy, and I got a little bit obsessive, and it got out of hand. And um, we decided that we maybe should be responsible with this resource and make a paper out of it. So this is what we've got. The bottom line is the ones in the northeast are way bigger than the ones in the West. So our coyotes are big. And when the local hunters tell you that they're big, they are. And sometimes they're big enough to hunt deer. Um, not enough to make a blind bit of difference to our deer population. Um, that's just not the case. But we do have, is the sound working OK? Yeah? OK. Stay away from the speakers, maybe. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, they do get some fawns, and they do get deer that are bogged down with the snow for certain. But they're not regularly hunting a number of deers that would matter. So, if you're a teacher and you want to play with this, you can get online, find it, and you can actually, there's a technique for measuring the skulls right from the photographs, all calibrated. So there we go, there's one of our coyotes from, one, from the project in the Intervale. And um, we get them rarely in daytime, mostly we get these black and white pictures at nighttime. But they're very distinctive, they've got these very lanky legs. Relative to their body, their tail is quite short, 
so you can really distinguish them quickly from the foxes. So we get lots of fun pictures of them. Sometimes they look at the camera, you know, and uh, I, I think they're cool looking animals. So I've, uh, this, is, this is how they react to the cameras. I was told when I started this, I was talking to Bill Kilpatrick at UVM, and he said to me, you're going to have a hard time getting photographs of coyotes. They're very, very camera shy. And this is a reaction from a coyote that's never encountered a trail camera before. Um, but what we've learned is that they habituate. And so when we run cameras around the calendar at St. Mike's, the animals habituate, and they come right up, they hang out, you know, and uh, you'll get lots of pictures, but they do need to habituate a little bit. The previous picture was in South Burlington in a place that we, we worked on with the Master Naturalist program. So several of uh, the people that Alicia had recruited in South Burlington, we got together and we put out cameras in uh, a natural area there. And those coyotes apparently had not experienced a camera before, so they were freaked. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll quickly go through this. This is the... the uh, coyotes that found, found my camera strap and uh, <laughs> yeah you get the idea so you can imagine how much fun my students have with this <laughs> yes they're gathering data but once in a while they run into something like this these are this is the, the weed fabric we put down so that your photographs aren't a bunch of waving weeds <laughs> so you know how could you not love these animals huh <laughs> So, but my, my good, and then, yeah, the next day, uh, Alicia, uh, or not Alicia, um, Alyssa came to pick up the cameras, and we got 11 minutes, 383 photos, 6 degree temperature rise on the camera, <laughs> and lost camera straps and weed fabrics, and they took them away, and who knows what they did with them. <laughs> Sometimes we get unusual color phase uh, coyotes, so this is Dave Baker, picked this one up in South Burlington, and at first I thought this was just sunlight, you know, what a nice, cool-looking picture. And then we got this fella in the same general area, and also this one. And I, I was convinced that was a domestic dog until we went back and looked at the series of pictures, and it looks like a coyote. So, fun. Anyway, this is one from recently. It says 23. That's a lie. <laughs> this is next year's coyote? <laughs> this is uh, Jacob Crawford's picture. Jacob is an undergrad student at UVM, and uh, if you're interested in birding, he is the guy in Vermont. He has been birding since he was 10 or something, and he knows the birds. He's young enough to have incredibly good ears. So when I go for a walk with him in the woods, as I did one time, he got 45 species or something like that. I got 12. Um, he's, he's a master birder at, at his young age, and I hope he goes off and becomes an ornithologist. But he photographed this animal um, on the ice um, between South Burlington and, and uh, Colchester. So what I suspect happened is a deer was coming across, bogged down through a hole in the ice, and then was got by the coyotes. Um, you know, when you're out looking at them, uh, you know, this is what you're mostly going to get, black and white pictures. So you got to look at the features. I won't spend long on this because I've got better slides for that coming. So here is a daytime gray fox. They've got this black stripe down the tail. They've got a cat-like face, super long tail, very, very distinctive. Here's the red fox, and Erica Mitchell is probably the, is, she certainly is the most active eye naturalist user in Vermont. She's incredible, incredible naturalist. I think she's like a water quality expert by training, but she's, she makes us all look like slouches as far as natural history goes. Anyway, this is one of hers, and um, there's the, the coyote, and you can see the coyote is a relatively shorter tail, so you can tell them apart pretty, pretty easily, even with black and white pictures, you know? Black socks. It's got to be a. It's got to be a red fox, and and they look almost white, in infrared flash at, at night time, and then you got this broad muzzle, lanky legs, relatively short tail. You got yourself a coyote. So you ready? Here we go. Who have we got? Gray fox. Here we go. Coyote. There somewhere. Any ideas? <laughs> I have no idea what that bloody thing is. I was hoping some of you would be able to tell me. <laughs> it came in on, a, uh, usually we get five frames in a row. This thing came in on a single frame and was gone in the next frame without even a footprint left behind. <laughs> so I think it's a mouse, but um, it's, it's got big ears and big, really big eyes. So I can't eliminate the flying squirrels. Who knows? <laughs> 
All right, highways. Okay, this got my attention. My local representative uh, sent me a, said, what do you think of this report? And this is the line. Common sense dictates that vertebrates would avoid the noises, sounds, sights, and smells of a four-lane divided highway with high-speed traffic, right? And I was thinking, I don't really think so. <laughs> so, you know, the mammals don't read the reports. And I have lots of pictures of animals going under. Any culvert I show you tonight is under I-89. It's the busiest highway we have. So raccoons treat it like a superhighway. It's a way to get under the highway and back again without getting killed, right? And I could literally could do a whole night just showing you cool pictures of raccoons walking, you know. This this is Centennial Woods. We put it, I wanted to point it right down the barrel and, and get a picture, right? The, the poor thing came out the first night that the camera was there and looked at the camera, posed, pulled back in again. He spent 20 minutes before he would leave. And then he finally habituated to the camera and left. And the night after that, gave it one look and left. But um, very much reacted to the camera the first day it was put there. But uh, yeah, they, they, they love culverts. This, this particular culvert is essentially a raccoon den. Um, I don't believe it goes through and the raccoon's den inside this particular culvert. But um, there's a mink way over there in the bottom left, and we get a few, not many of those, but we get them. Uh, what else have we got? Oh yeah, this is a video. And what do you think, Walter? Are we risk another video? <laughs> so that location that the person was talking about in the South Burlington report, this is the location. And this, I think, is the fifth or sixth night that we had the camera up. And so what you're looking at is the culvert under I-89. Top left of the screen, you can see to the far side of the culvert, that right rectangle you see is the exit to the median of the highway. So essentially, you know, the animal can go under. This is southbound. So it can go under southbound. If you watch the very end of the video, you'll see his head pop up there. And once he gets out the far end, he's in the median. And then uh, we have got we did put a camera at the other end, and we picked up, coyote, we picked up um, bobcats coming out the other end as well. So they're using this as a conduit to safely traverse the highway. And let's see what happens. OK, it's going to do it again. So I don't think I can advance. If you wouldn't mind advancing me, that would be fabulous. My wife is a Macintosh person. All right, this is another of Jacob's photographs. So Jacob got this. He, he brings a long lens with him, so he uses it as a telescope. And when he sees a cool bird, he photographs them. But he saw the bobcat this day. So once the coyotes left that, that deer on the ice, the bobcat moved in. The, the bobcat hung back until the coyote was gone. So I don't know if that tells us anything about the hierarchy among the animals, but um, it definitely wasn't messing with the coyote. But it went in and it had a snack after the coyote was gone because, you know, nothing goes to waste in nature. So um, this, is, this is just a little gift we put together. So uh, this is from a recent, uh, this is from December. And you'll see that the skunk comes out and the cat, you know, the bobcat backs away, and uh, it just shows you that a skunk is not necessarily an easy target. And two bobcats are involved in this, and I don't know if they got a skunk or not because most of the action doesn't happen in front of my camera. <laughs> so, but we, I love the bobcats. They're, they're really my favorite thing to see on camera, and you get a whole string of these things together. Here's another. Sometimes they are successful hunting. <laughs> so. Uh, Sad day for the squirrel, I guess. And sometimes they are disrespectful to our cameras, if you could even imagine such a thing. So there's a nice clear picture, right? And then uh, it backs up to the camera and marks the camera. And everything is fuzzy after that. <laughs> and uh, Alyssa went out the next day um, unaware of what, she, what we had. And she took the corner of her t-shirt because there was a smudge on the lens. And she cleaned off the lens and brought the SD card home. And a week later, she looked at it and she said, ah. Oh, I'm really glad I laundered that shirt right away. <laughs> so anyway, off it went. So uh, this one, that's actually a video too. Can we show that one? <laughs> Walter's getting his exercise tonight. I, I got to say, uh, when I was in grad school, I was always jealous of what, what the field naturalists were doing. And uh, so uh, I was went back and did the master naturalist program. There he goes, marking his territory. Or she, I don't know. But uh, that's a log through a wetland. And if you're going to put cameras out, I suggest you pick logs. Let's see if we go forward. Yeah, success. OK. Looks like it's working again. So lots of bobcats, and I love them all. So uh, uh, you know, uh, if you put a camera strap right onto the surface of a log, the animals that are walking along the log, you'll get this type of shot. They, they treat the logs as a, as a sort of a ramp through the vegetation, and you'll get 
all sorts of things, things you wouldn't expect, like groundhogs will walk along the length of a log, and you'll get these nice face-to-face -face pictures. So, love them. <laughs> and this is a uh, mom with two kittens, I suspect. And the kittens are, you know, relatively shorter legs and a little stumpier. So, uh, it tells me that we've got kittens on, on campus, which is kind of cool. You know. <laughs> so, uh, people sometimes ask me if I have links, and they try to convince me that some of my pictures are links. We don't have them around this general area. We, they are coming into Vermont occasionally, um, but they have a really obvious long hind leg, and they're very, very different in terms of the length of the back leg. So I don't believe I've ever seen one on my cameras, that's for sure. And of course, my hunter friend tells me that we've got mountain lions too, but I don't really believe that one. <laughs> I'm not going to do that debate. Fisher, we get lots of fishers. Um, not as many as the other animals. So I'll show you a few fisher pictures, but they're not as common uh, on the cameras as even bobcats. So um, we get some nice, usually nighttime pictures. Um, this is one of Lena's. Um, you can kind of see him in the middle there, looking at the uh, at the water. And there's one of Lena's also climbing up and down the tree there. <laughs> um, they are remarkable. They can climb vertically. If you see a video of one chasing a squirrel, they'll circle. They'll circle, they'll come above and below the squirrel, and eventually they'll either scare the squirrel to the ground or they'll grab it and fall to the ground. They are remarkable hunters. Um, they're kind of infamous for getting um, porcupines, and they're also well known for going after snowshoe hare. You're not going to get either one of them around here, so they're eating other things as well. But we sure, sure as heck have them in the Burlington area. So, they're kind of cool looking animals. So, and um, we have mink showing up frequently. Um, this is one of Larry uh, Tarfield's photos. Larry is a postdoctoral associate in the Rubenstein lab, and he shows up in our natural area. He's one of the uh, biggest eye naturalists in the St. Mike's natural area. He's got a whole bunch of observations, but he's got some great photos. So that's another one of his. And he, I sent him an email. People are very generous. Send him an email. Hey, can I use your photos? They're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so I like to give him credit. So what else have we got? Weasels. Um, so. Long tail weasel, short tail weasel. If you had one and you could measure everything, you can easily tell them apart. And um, on a trail camera, I have no idea if it's. I, I don't even try it. So it's like okay, that's a weasel, and uh, this one uh, disappeared under. The, I think it disappeared. What do you think? Do you think it went under? I think it went under after a mouse. <laughs> Here's one that has a mouse. When you see an animal with four eyes or three eyes, you're like, yeah, something's going on here. <laughs> so it it drops the mouse on the log. It, explores some more, and eventually he went back, picked the mouse up, and went, took off. Sometimes we get them, obviously, in their winter phase. I knew I had a picture of one in their winter phase, and I was looking for it two nights ago, and I, in my memory, it was a beautiful picture with the animal's face and everything, but how can I tell you? National Geographic is not calling for it, but it is white. <laughs> so, otters are another of my favorite, and uh, I think this is one of Lena's, yeah, it is one of Lena's, based on the date. So um, sometimes you just get a fuzzy blur, and you have to look at the sequence and play it back and forth a few times to convince yourself that it isn't a mink. But when you see that large, powerful tail, you know you, you can fairly easily convince yourself. And I, I love to see them. So uh, this one is a video as well. <laughs> I'm sorry, Walter. <laughs> Someday I'll learn Macintosh. <laughs> And this is that same culvert in South Burlington where no mammals would uh, venture near the highway. And this one swims right under. And uh, on the live video, you know, when, when you play it back, you can hear the trucks going over and back. So it's, um, what do you think? Let's see. Oh, there he goes again. <laughs> okay. And uh, oh, my photo credit ran away. Uh, so Mark Fauscher and his wife, they travel the world and they are eye naturalists everywhere. And if you look at their map of, of observations, it's on every continent you could imagine. But they were in the St. Mike's natural area and got this couple swimming along there, and so they let me use the picture. So, opossums. Opossums are kind of cool. When I got to Vermont, they were just making it here. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting. There are various people who fight about climate change, and, and they can fight all they want. But the opossums have been moving north as the climate has been warming. And if you look at the old field guides, you can see where they were before, and you can see where they are now. And if you look at iNaturalist observations over time, 
you can see that they've just made it north of Augusta, Maine, along the coast. And uh, the most recent observations are the ones that are in the north. So it's kind of cool. They weren't there three years ago, but they are now. So the movement is still happening. They're now north of Montreal. They're now north of, of uh, Toronto. So they're on the move. And this isn't movement since, you know, the glacial interchange, that the interchange when, when the Isthmus of Panama appeared. This is a, a more recent movement. <laughs> So we get lots of them, and uh, this one, what have I got on here? Oh yeah, this is just to show you one, uh, APHIS, which is uh, part of the US Department of Agriculture, put a, a, a collar on this one, and they, APHIS is interested in opossums because when they are baiting for um, rabies, um, the opossums don't get rabies, but they eat the bait. So APHIS wants to know what the opossums are doing so they can figure out how to avoid them and have more of their bait go to the raccoons and the foxes and other things like that. So, but opossums play possum. So here we have an opossum, and it is being investigated. There's the opossum, and there's a coyote. So there it is, fairly vertical. And the next slide, it falls over sideways. And I read about this in grade school in Ireland, and it seemed to me ludicrous that this was a defense. But it is. And you'll see what happens. He gives him a little sniff, enough to move him. He comes up and investigates the camera. He goes back for another sniff. And this thing smells like death because it has exuded a fluid out of a land near its rear end. It's lying there with its mouth open and its tongue sticking out. It looks dead. And it smells like it's been dead forever, right? And so the coyote is like, OK, I want fresh food. I'm out of here. And so look at the timestamp. It's 3.46 AM. And nothing happens until 3.50 when the opossum becomes Lazarus and takes off, takes off across the log like nothing happened. <laughs> so they do, in fact, play possum. I, I, you couldn't plan to get this on camera, but it happened. <laughs> so um, when you put 22 cameras out for six years in a row, you're going to find some fun stuff. So um, this, is what, yeah, this is my favorite. This is my favorite of, of all the photos that Lena and her group got together. This is my favorite. So, you know, you, you see pictures of this, you see drawings of this, but you, you don't often catch them on camera. So, yeah, there's, there's mom opossum and, and baby on board. <laughs> Three babies on board at least. I think there was maybe five when you looked at the whole sequence. Am I right, Dina? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the eyes give it away for you. So, rats in Vermont. I, I'm, I, how am I doing for time, Walter? Can I, can I do my rat story? Okay. So, rats in Vermont. Not so much, or grammatically speaking, not so many. Um, if you look at the observations on iNaturalist in all of Vermont for rats, and the reason I'm following up with rats is I'd, I'd like us all to appreciate the rich predator population that we have. And if we can sustain those populations, our towns can be bobcat, fox, fisher towns, and not become rat and squirrel towns. Want to live in a rat and squirrel town? Well, get rid of all of your woodland patches, and you can do that. And we don't want to do that, but this is the choir, I suspect, right? <laughs> but uh, maybe somebody out there is influencing policy a little bit and help us protect, protect our patches. So we don't have very many rats. And I, you know, I'm, I'm personally happy about that. And so you might think, well, so here's some comparisons. So red fox observations, you know, more than 1,000. Coyotes, almost 1,000. Bobcats, 475. How many people have seen a bobcat in the wild? Right? This is a room full of naturalists. That's a lot more hands than I'd expect to go up in a typical audience. I've never seen one. My 15-year-old daughter has, and I'm infinitely jealous. So anyway, uh, gray fox, 502. Anyone seen a gray fox in the wild? We took a woman to give her a tour to natural area. One, one of our donors took her for a tour to natural area. We got halfway down a hill. And a gray fox trotted out across in front of us. And it was almost like, you know, we had done the, release the fox, you know? You couldn't plan it. <laughs> anyway, so it could be that people don't think a rat observation is worth recording, right? So you need to correct for bias. And this is where we need Erica Mitchell. Because Erica faithfully records every species that she finds, right? Uh, any questions as we go, by the way? I'm, I'm rattling on here, but I'm open to questions anytime. We're all good? OK. You can ask an entomologist about mammals as much as you want. So Erica has 109,000 observations in Vermont, right? 
she has a regular circuit that she walks and she has 15 trail cameras that she maintains. And so I asked her how many rats she had. And the answer, well, I'll first give you her, her other numbers. Red Fox, which is, you know, a quarter of the Vermont observations. Coyotes, bobcats, gray fox, rats. Okay? So this is, a, I would say, is about as unbiased a sample as you're going to get in Vermont. And this, this is the quote from the emails that I sent her. She sent me back. If I see a mammal, I shoot it. And she doesn't mean with a gun. Okay? I've submitted both rats that I've seen live and trail cameras. So any rat that she has seen, she has recorded. So I think we've got a low rat population. It doesn't mean they're not here, but we haven't got a lot of them. And it's because, I, I think, of the, uh, the, the diverse uh, predator population that we're able to maintain. So rats in Burlington, I, since we're in Burlington, just two of them on iNaturalist, and there's one of Larry's, Larry's photo. Kind of cute, really, if you like rats. <laughs> My daughter is in New York City, and uh, her roommate stepped on a rat two weeks ago. <laughs> I kid you not. So uh, this is uh, this photo is from uh, Chelsea Carroll in Benson, Vermont, and this is why I think we have fewer rats. She has been watching these this fox family living in a collapsed barn, and she is fascinated to see how the rat provisions, uh, not the rat, the fox mom provisions the family. She drops um, rats, and she drops rabbits, and she drops squirrels in different locations around the broken barn sort of teaching teaching the babies how to do what they do, right? <laughs> so, anyway, um, how am I doing for time, Walter? Okay, I'm going to do a little bit on the deer story then, and we'll probably stop after the deer. And unless people have questions. I've mostly gone, as you can tell, for the big mammals. I'm not telling you about squirrels. I'm not, you know, we're not going, we're not going to go into the rodents because they're not as exciting. And I, honestly, I should tell you, in fairness, probably 85% of my images that I do get are of gray squirrels. And raccoons are, are, are a close second. So here's the deer history. You probably all know that we almost hunted them to extinction. And in Vermont in particular, they were almost extirpated in the 1700s. And 17 white-tailed deer were brought in to repopulate the state. Can you imagine a world where 17 deer would make even an impression on our population? That's where we were before we had hunting regulations, right? And people were hunted deer until they were nearly gone. So there you go. And now they're back. And they are back in big numbers. And I'll show you some numbers. And sometimes we get somebody like this showing the velvet off to the camera. And here are some numbers in Vermont. So you can see right when those 17 or whatever number was were brought in, right? You can see what has happened. This is the number of deers hunted, which is one metric of, of deer population. The state has a target for a certain number per square mile, and we're currently at the high end of their target, so uh, the deer population has not got any problems. Well, maybe there's too many of them. Um, I look in the natural area where I work, and I can see evidence of heavy deer browse. And here's the issue in my where I'm working. Um, you can't hunt in Burlington. You can't hunt in Winooski. You can't hunt in South Burlington, and we're all in the lower Winooski Valley. And so Colchester is one area where you could hunt. Problem is, when we had hunters uh, in the natural area, they started yelling at the students and telling the students that they shouldn't be here during hunting season, which blew my mind because essentially, one way or another, you're, you're yelling at the landowner, right? They're a tuition-paying student on their own campus. So we, we, we posted our area, so now you can't hunt there either. <laughs> and the problem, of course, is that we've got too many deer, and that's, that's for sure. So we have to somehow confront that and deal with that. But we no longer have hunters yelling at students. So, But this is a lesson for hunters. I respect hunters, but um, there are a few bad apples out there who you know, do that kind of behavior, and, and they mess it up for the other hunters. The other thing is, of course, once we got the, well, once we got the signs up, we had three hunters come in, and of course, we got them on trail cameras, and we turned them over to the warden, and they got prosecuted, and I don't know. <laughs> they got charged with illegal possession of a deer. I didn't even know that was what the name of the crime was going to be, but anyway. <laughs> so, but well, we get lots of deer on campus, and here are hunting numbers town by town, and so you can pick out South Burlington, you can pick out Burlington, you can pick out Winooski, and you'll see that those numbers are low. 
and that is an issue we're going to have in our in in our general area that the deer numbers um, are, are quite high so so there you go but they pose for the camera periodically and they come right up and investigate the cameras <laughs> and uh, yeah I, I love seeing them but uh, they, I can see what they're doing to the brows and we're actively planting trees in this area so this is when it was a cornfield this is where we're restoring this is where we're planting trees and I'm seeing some of my trees getting topped and getting topped the following year and you can imagine what happens from there to become a bush and uh, so we have some issues but they are cute as all heck <laughs> oh yeah here we go this is when I wish I had it on video you know but we had it on stills and they kept pushing each other around for many many frames and once you see once you see the antlers on both of them you you'll, you'll predict a winner pretty quickly <laughs> you know so there's the there's the eventual winner but uh, comes in and marks his territory at some point yeah he comes back now to mark his territory there you go territory marked and he comes back for more and he gets chased off again <laughs> so um, you know, when you watch the Discovery Channel, this is what you see. You see the, 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 the deer fight, or you see the animals having major aggression. It, it's relatively uncommon. Six years worth to get two pictures like this, maybe. <laughs> so, oh, we should, that's already been in there. That's already been in there. Okay, I think we should wrap it up. What do you think? Well, that's pretty open to questions. Yeah, take any questions. Yeah, I might even have answers. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Yeah. Who's up? There you go. Has the, has your images or any of the data that you have access to influenced policy and, and uh, decisions that towns need to make for development purposes? So have, have my photographs made any difference to policy? I hope so in South Burlington. Um, those two reports came out. One was done using modern GIS techniques that evaluated all of our woodlands and ranked them. And the one I was looking at, this other report written by a private consultant, said, no, no, it's meaningless and there are no wildlife there. It made me a little mad. And uh, so I went out in the middle of winter and stuck out a trail camera. Um, I wrote my own report. And to be honest, I spent half a day on it. I, I wrote what is essentially a, an undergrad-style lab report, but properly sourced and everything else. And I made it very clear that the report saying there was no wildlife was simply wrong. And I circulated that to any legislator who had an email address online and that was relevant to South Burlington and that's my timer to tell me to shut up. And so um, I hope it matters, you know, but I don't know. But I, I do think when there are developers saying that a patch of land has no wildlife, um, it's very easy to confront that with data if it's simply untrue. So I think that's something we can do. So I've limited powers. <laughs> But I can use little ones I have. A bit of rabble rousing is good, right? Alicia. I, I don't I don't know the law, honestly, but um South Burlington is trying to plan for wildlife corridors and that's why they hi hired the Arrowwood Consultant Company to, to, to look at that. And they did the things that you'd expect. They used spatial analysis. Like they went out and they did all of the modern tools you'd expect. And they got criticized by some developers like they've never even walked the properties. Well, you know, sometimes you don't need to. Sometimes it's actually more obvious by looking from, from a helicopter view or a, an aerial view, right? Or a satellite. <laughs> but then when we do walk it and we ground truth it, it turns out they were right. <laughs> so yeah. But a little bit of old school natural history doesn't hurt, right? With a, with a with the, the the new toy that I like I love to play with. What have you got? Um, I guess uh, what type of habitat designation finds the most? What do you find the most wildlife? And is it forest or do you grasslands? So I, I've I've looked at basically three habitat types. I've looked at wetland. I've looked at grassland. I've looked at woodland. I find if I'm into transition zones, I get more diversity, and it's not shocking. Because there are things like deer that like the open areas. There are things like raccoons that would like it more wooded. So if you're right on the fence, it's an ecotone and you, 
you're going to get a bit of everything, you know what I mean? The wetland areas, I haven't explored as much as I'd like, and there are species specifically that do like the wetlands, so mink, otter, beaver, I'm not going to get them up in the field. The problem where we work at St. Mike's is it is active floodplain, and if you go as far as Limekiln Road, there's a bridge there, and it crosses the Winooski River Gorge, and it is a pinch point, so I can't put as many cameras in the floodplain as I'd like because at some point they're going to get submerged, and then I've spent, you know, 180 bucks worth of equipment that's destroyed. So I don't work in the wetlands as much as I'd like to. But we did work downstream from there, and we were able to get the, the mammals that we that we never get on camera. So in, in Lena's project, we were able to get otters and mink and things that I never see, which is exciting. Yeah. I'm fascinated by your rat hypothesis. Have you looked at that in regards to any other state? The rat hypothesis. No, I dreamed that up as an aquatic entomologist. I thought, wow, where are, where are our rats? You know, so um, I think that's a study waiting to be done. If it hasn't already been done, um, I think it would be very easy to pull out iNatural. There, there's a natural iNaturalist project for somebody to do. Um, that, that could be done, but I haven't done it. So this is, this is something I, this is, you can call this the McCabe rat hypothesis. How about that? <laughs> so completely unpublishable <laughs> until we get more data. Um, do you think that there would be more rats um, in a bigger city where there weren't as many natural predators? I, I suspect so. And there's a cool project you can look up called Gotham Coyote, where they have put trail cameras in New York City and they have gotten coyotes on camera. And I'd say that's probably going to be one of the best, richest data sources to answer your question. But I don't have a good answer, but I think you're right. I think it wasn't an accident that my daughter's roommate stepped on a rat. She sure as heck didn't step anywhere near a coyote. So, but there are coyotes. There was one hanging out in Central Park for a while. So kind of cool, you know? They, they get there. So it's fun. The other thing I wanted to add to all of this is, um, you know, I'm an aquatic ecologist, and we live in different worlds. Um, there are some people who look at, you know, the large universities versus a, a, a primarily undergrad college and they, they wonder what the comparison is. And the comparison is I'm 75% teacher and 25% researcher. And my wife who's at the university is 75% researcher and she's maybe 10% teacher. So it, it's different. The other advantage I think of a small college is I can play with trail cameras and no one thinks twice about it. Like, oh yeah, he's doing biology. So I can go and play with this and devote as much time as I want to it. And it doesn't, you know, <laughs> no one's complaining. And I'm having a good time. So I get to spread my wings. I get to try different things. If you end up working on a small college, you expect, they expect that you will have to teach X, even though your expertise is in Y. So you have to learn a lot fast. And it's, it's, a, it's an adventure. And... Uh, I was kind of getting a little tired of looking at a microscope all the time, so I went back and did the Master Naturalist program for, for fun, and uh, it's given me some new perspectives. So, anyway, a little bit of a little bit of off topic. Any other questions? All right. Okay, and there's one at the back too. Good. Yes. Um, I, I, I think ideally you want to have uh, those stepping stones be as close together as you can. And so when you eliminate one stepping stone, you have dramatically increased the distance between the next two. So I think as we look at our green spaces, we want to make, preserve those. The other part of your question is the, the corridor I was looking at was connecting um, just south of the highway near Heinsberg Road. And uh, there's a small little strip of woodlands behind sort of the area where Timberlane is. You know, Timberlane Dental and all of those little, there's a small strip of woodland there. And it's, it looks on a map, it looks insignificant, but when you walk in there, you see bobcat footprints and you see red fox, well, I don't know, fox footprints, I can't tell them apart, camera can. But you do see, you know, and, and, and then from there, they can get over towards the whale tails, which is open grass. And from there, they can get over to Muddy Brook. So, the, you know, they, they do connect. 
So I think we need to preserve as many patches as we can. You had a question also? I do have a question. Um, years ago, we had Vermont Fish and Wildlife Game Warden come to our preschool, and they had great images, too, from trail cameras of many different animals, um, including a lynx yeah. around Bennington or something. Yeah. From their trail camps, do you ever um, partner with them or share, or is there any way to, like... Is there any connection there? Yeah. Um, but there's a couple of connections. We, we did get some help um, when we started doing the project in Intervale with Lena. Some of those folks came and consulted with us and helped us out. And we had a great conversation about trail cameras. Um, but uh, I haven't been putting cameras out in the areas they're interested in. Frequently, they're monitoring way far deep in the woods in areas that are impractical for me to work with with an army of undergrad students. So there's that. Um, the, the most recent interaction I've had with them, uh, I'm doing an aquatic biology class in the fall, and our ichthyologist has retired. And so I want to involve fish in my course in some shape or form. And so I'm taking the, a training course so I can lead people in fishing groups. I've been leading people fishing for a long time, but if I take the course, my students don't have to get a fishing license. So I'm, I'm taking a fish and wildlife training at the moment, to, uh, and I'll be fingerprinted and background checked, and inspected and injected and God knows what they're going to do to me <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll be I'll be certified to take them fishing but uh, the fish and wildlife folks have been really helpful they've led some clinics on ice fishing for example and most recently with one of our, our campus student groups so uh, yeah there's there's a lot of really good professionals over there and there's a lot we can learn from them and they're willing to share which is great so and, and I, you prove it you know that they, they came to your preschool right <laughs> so anyway yeah there you go yeah. Any other questions? I'm putting the hook on you there. Okay, the big hook. Excellent. <laughs> but I, I can't tell you how inspired I am as an educator at the nearby university to emulate some of your ideas and visit this incredible new natural area that you're restoring. It's fantastic. Let's hear it uh, for Declan. It's an awesome presentation.